Parallel Journeys, Chapter 13, A Meeting with Mein Fuhrer. Rabin and I firmly believed that the Lutwaff would call us up within weeks. We were 16, ready and even eager to fight. Roman Fallman, another member of our unit, found our enthusiasm quite funny. Do you two realize, he asked, that a green, inexperienced Lutwaff pilot can expect to live all of 33 days? Who cares? Rabbit replied scornfully. Only one thing mattered to us, and that was flying. But for Alphonse, the Lutwaff would have to wait. The D-Day landings in June had brought thousands of Allied troops treacherously close to the fatherland. At first, Hitler Youth members were not worried. They blindly believed Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels when he said the invasion would give Germany a good chance to get the American enemy and wipe him out on the beaches. But before long, even the Hitler Youth could see that this was a lie. Toward the end of the month, our commander ordered all Hitler Youth members, 15 and older, to meet in our gymnasium. Several hundred of us were jam-packed, right up to the stage. Soon, the commander appeared along with several high-ranking Hitler Youth leaders. Heil Hitler, comrade N, he shouted, his right arm extended. Heil Hitler, Führer!" we roared back. As you know, comrade N, he began, the enemy appears to be making some progress inland. We must strengthen our lines and drive him back. He motioned at a man next to him and said, Colonel Malden here will be organizing the Hitler Youth to defend the West Wall. A murmur of disbelief rang through the hall. Could the Allies really be this close? We had thought they were hundreds of miles away. Surely the Führer didn't think they would get as far as the West Wall. The West Wall, known to the Americans as the Siegfried Line, was a deep, heavily guarded line of defense that ran along the western border of Germany. Hitler had ordered the wall built in 1936 as protection against what was then a remote possibility of invasion. The line stretched some 300 miles north from Switzerland to the border of Holland. It was guarded like a sacred fortress, the gateway into the fatherland. With the enemy firmly footed on European soil, defending the West Wall now became extremely important. Hitler knew that to hold back the Allies, he would have to gather his forces behind the wall. A tough stand here would send the enemy reeling back westward, away from Germany. He could then turn his troops east to face the Russian invaders. That plan would work well if the soldiers at the front were able to hold the line, but if they failed, the task of defending the West Wall would fall to the Hitler Youth. There was dead silence in the gymnasium as the Führer lifted his hand. The primary task of the Hitler Youth, he began, will be to free up regular troops for frontline duty. We must be prepared, comrade N. Enemy breakthroughs are possible. We are the first line of defense in the West. The Fuhrer himself has no doubt about our ability to do this. Within a few minutes, the hall emptied. Only about 50 of us remained. I was quite surprised when I was called to the stage, and I listened intently while some of the leaders discussed our situation. One of them was my Bonfuhrer, the major general in charge of our Bon of 3,000 to 6,000 boys. Since most of these kids are students, he observed, we can have them ready in 48 hours, along with 60 or 70 more members from the General Hitler Youth. That will be our first unit. Then turning to me, he said, and you're going to be in charge of it. Me, Bonfuhrer? I stammered. I was stunned. Yes, he replied. Heck, you are the new Juffelstaffuhrer of Flyer Juffelstaff 12. He held out his hand. Congratulations. It never had occurred to me that at 16 years old, I would become a Juffelstaffuhrer, a rank nearly equal to an army captain, in charge of 150 to 190 boys. I had been planning on the Lutwaff. Later, my commander told me why I had been chosen. I decided on you, Heck, because... I think you can get yourself and your units out of ticklish situations. You're a clever operator, my boy. Where he was going, Alphonse would need to be a clever operator. He and his boys were ordered to man anti-aircraft equipment on the border near Remish Luxembourg. At the same time, they would be doing construction work along a section of the West Wall. As he gave Alphonse his orders, the commander handed him a new pistol. A gift from me, he said, but please remember one thing. You ever let me down, you'd better use it on yourself. They shook hands. Good luck, Alf. You're on your own. I'll see you in a few weeks. Before he left, I asked permission to make Roman Fallman my second in command. Go ahead and promote him, my leader agreed. You'll need a friend out there. By the way, you and everybody else on the West Wall are now on the payroll. From that moment on, I was a paid professional leader of the Hitler Youth. But the money was not, the impor not that important to me. It was power that I craved. The new Jeffelstaff Führer gathered his boys, and headed them toward the train station.
The trip to their new post was only 40 miles, yet it took all night for the train to make its way through the rubble left by the bombings. When they arrived in Remish, they were greeted by Oberlieutenant, First Lieutenant Hans Levitz, a war hero who had lost his left arm in battle. Where do you want your boys to stay, was Levitz's first question. He explained that Heck could order every family in Remish to make room for 10 Hitler Youth boys in their houses, or he could take over the local convent and school. Which did he prefer? Levitz suggested that the, that the nuns might not like their school being used as Hitler Youth headquarters, but that was the choice Alphonse made. Forget about them, he snapped at the Oberlieutenant. We were taken out of our school, and as far as I'm concerned, this is total war. Levitz looked at Alphonse and began to grin broadly. He could see that the power was taking hold. As it happened, the nuns did not protest when asked to give up their school, but one of the teachers, an elderly man, did get quite upset. On whose orders are you acting? he demanded. Levitz pointed to me, saying, The Hitler youth is in charge. Please don't make it hard on yourself. But this is just a boy, raved the man, shaking his finger at me. I wasn't used to anyone defying an order, least of all a Luxembourg school teacher. Throw this man out, I ordered. If he comes back, shoot him. When my boys grabbed him, the teacher began to shake. Please, he whimpered, let me go. After that, the villagers knew we meant to be tough. The boys never questioned Heck's order to shoot. If the teacher had come back, they certainly would have shot him. Hitler Youth members were used to strict discipline. Their training had taught them to obey an order without thinking. Now that Germany was fighting for its life, the importance of following orders was even greater. They knew how desperately the fatherland needed them. They would do whatever was asked without complaining or questioning. And so the boys settled down to their tedious task of digging an endless ditch along the West Wall. It was astonishing how fast these kids grew up under such tremendous pressure. Most of them acted like tough, experienced men. Many had already lost a father or brother in battle, and they had developed a hard outer shell toward death. I no longer worried about my ability to command them. At 16, I too had become tough and hardened. I loved my position of authority. Although I was still anxious to fly for the Lutwaff, I realized that this would mean giving up the power I held. To my surprise, that power would soon increase by leaps and bounds. It was a raw October afternoon. At points along the west wall, several Jeffelstaff units were digging diligently on the ditch. Suddenly, out of the hills, two RAF Spitfire planes spotted three German supply trucks traveling along the road where the boys were working. Instantly, they swooped down to attack. In the chaos that followed, two Hitler Youth members were killed by machine gun fire. Others, severely burned, screamed in pain until two soldiers gave them soothing shots of morphine. Only when the screams died down did Alphonse hear yelling from the ditch. Running closer, he saw Unterbahnfuhrer Lammers, the 19-year-old commander of all units in the region. He was sprawled in the bottom of the ditch, obviously dying. Can you believe this? Lammers moaned. I survived Stalingrad to die like this. And then acting as a good leader who must keep the chain of command unbroken, he gasped. You're in charge now, heck. The next day, Hitler Youth Headquarters made Lammers' last order official. At the age of 16, Alphonse Heck became an Unterbahnfuhrer, a rank equal to a brigadier general in the United States Army. He would be in charge of 2,800 boys and 80 girls spread out over four villages. There was little time to bask in the glory of my promotion. There was too much to do. Three days after the attack, I ordered a rally of 800 boys to honor our dead comrades whose bodies had been shipped home. At the end of the service, we sang the tradi traditional song of farewell to dead heroes. Ich hat einen Kameraden. I once had a comrade, a better one you cannot find. It was a simple but moving ceremony, and it put fear in the hearts of some of the younger members who had just arrived. Shortly after that, we had our first desertions. When they saw how close to death they were, some of the boys got scared and ran for home. None were older than 15, and all were caught by SS field police. I ordered most of them sent to a punishment unit, but one was a squad leader from Wittlich Burncastle. It embarrassed me that he was from my home area, and I felt like hitting him. Instead, I ripped off his insignia and ordered him to report to an officer in Remish. A few days later, he was shipped to the Russian front to fight. It was a fate equal to death. I am sure he never came back. Alphonse found that with his new power came tremendous responsibility. He now had to make split-second decisions that affected the lives of hundreds of boys. If his decisions were wrong, he could be shot. He was reminded of this one evening when he called his Bonfuhrer to report the day's activities. For God's sake, heck, be sure your units don't panic at the sound of gunfire. Then he told about a leader who had been shot by the Gestapo for pulling his boys away from artillery fire. I'm warning you, heck, the Gestapo is more dangerous than the Americans. 
Quickly, the Bon Fuhrer caught himself. How could he be sure that Alphonse wouldn't turn him in for making such a remark? Clearing his throat, he continued, <clears throat> Forget what I said about the Gestapo, Heck. Just make sure you keep your boys from taking off. You know what I mean? It's your life that's on the line. The power of the Gestapo had gotten out of hand. No one who was arrested, not even a military officer, could protest. There was no appeal, no trial by jury. The decision of the Gestapo was final and usually fearful. Hitler wanted it that way. With the growing fear came a growing belief among certain military officers that Der Fuhrer was a demented demon from hell. Among those officers was Army Colonel Count von Stauffenberg. Toward the beginning of 1944, Stauffenberg and a few close associates began plotting to kill Adolf Hitler. Their aim was not to take over power themselves. They simply wanted to save Germany from a leader they now believed to be a madman. Because of his high rank, Stauffenberg attended many top-level staff meetings of the most important Nazis. One of these meetings, he decided, would be the perfect place to assassinate Hitler. Several times in the first seven months of the year, assassination plans were made, but something always happened at the last minute to stop them. Finally, on July 20th, Stauffenberg and his men were ready. A meeting had been called at Wolf's Lair, Hitler's headquarters, deep in a dark, gloomy pine forest of East Prussia, now Poland. Stauffenberg arrived at Wolf's Lair carrying a briefcase. Inside was a bomb wrapped in an old shirt. The meeting had already started when the colonel entered the room and took his seat near Hitler. Placing his briefcase under the map table on which Hitler was leaning, he quickly excused himself to make a phone call. Exactly on schedule at 12.50 p.m., the bomb exploded. Four of the 24 people in the room were killed, but Hitler was not one of them. He had been saved by the thickness of the heavy wooden table. In the seconds right after the explosion, Der Fuhrer appeared calm, although one pant leg had been blown off and his right arm, arm hung stiffly by his side. Taking advantage of the confusion that followed, Stauffenberg slipped into an airplane and headed back to Berlin, but by the time he arrived, his part in the plot was known. Hitler went on a national radio to assure the German people that he was unharmed and vowed death to those who had tried to assassinate him. He was true to his word. Over the next several months, nearly 5,000 people were killed, merely on the slightest suspicion of having been involved. Stauffenberg was one of them. Still fearing for the future of his country, he went to his death crying, Long live our sacred Germany! Across the Reich, security became much tighter after the July 20th plot. Hitler trusted no one, not even the Hitler Youth, his most fanatic supporters. At his base near Remisch, Alphonse could sense the change. Late one evening in the last week of November, I had a call from an SS captain. He asked me to be ready early in the next morning for what he would not say. Promptly at 6 o'clock a.m., a, a camouflage-painted Mercedes met me. The driver was a second lieutenant in the SS, perhaps a year older than I. We're going for a ride, he grinned at me. Where to, I asked, and why the secrecy? I can't tell you the exact location, he said. This is really top-level stuff. We headed east toward the River Saar. The slit of light from the car's headlights barely cut through the fog and drizzle. After several miles, we came into a clearing in the middle of a dense forest. I stared in surprise at an armored train surrounded by SS soldiers in full battle dress, all armed with submachine guns. Obviously, this train belonged to some very important official. A large diesel locomotive was hitched to three long train cars and a flatbed. On the flatbed was an 88 millimeter anti-aircraft gun with a full crew on board. The train was painted camouflage green. Thick armor plate steel covered the wheels and windows. At the door to the center car, an SS major checked Alphonse's pass, took his gun, and frisked him like a criminal. All around stood fully armed SS soldiers, some with large German shepherd dogs. When Alphonse bent down to pet one, the dog snarled and growled at him. Inside the car was paneled in oak and furnished with oaken benches and tables. Carved in the mahogany ceiling was a huge German eagle, a swastika clutched in its claws. Silver ice buckets and crystal goblets with bottles of mineral water stood on the tables. The command, Achtung, brought us to heel-clicking attention. There were about 50 people in the car, some Hitler youth leaders, many military officials, and a few high-ranking government men. I've never seen security like this in all my life, I remarked to a Bonfuhrer standing near me. Well, he said, I suppose you've never met Albert Speer either. I was impressed. Albert Speer, Minister of Armaments and Ammunitions, was one of the two or three most powerful men in Germany. We jumped to attention when he entered the room, but he just lifted his hand and smiled. Please, mine Aaron, at ease. He looked around the car, focusing his eyes on the Hitler Youth leaders. Boys, he said, you have done a fine job. And then he told us, frankly, that we were in danger of losing the war. We stared at each other in stunned silence. If any of us had talked like this, we would have been shot for treason. 
Being told that they were losing the war may have come as a shock to Hitler Youth leaders, but high-ranking Nazis could clearly see the disaster that lay ahead. American forces were frightfully close to German soil. By mid-November, the U.S. Third Army had pushed its way through France. Troops were now within a few miles of the Luxembourg border where Alphonse's units were stationed. German soldiers were fighting fiercely, but it was clear that soon the Amis, the American soldiers, would break through their lines. Berlin was being blasted in bombing raids by the RAF. In just two days, British aircraft attacked the capital city 16 different times. German anti-aircraft fighters were powerless to stop the British wave. Of the 402 RAF planes involved, they were able to shoot down only nine. Berlin was not the only German city to be hit. U.S. and British planes also attacked Aachen on the border with Holland. The ancient city was nearly destroyed, and three nearby towns were blown completely from the face of the earth. Despite these defeats, Albert Speer encouraged the German people to fight on, speaking directly to Hitler youth leaders in the train car, he assured them, Victory can still be ours if we are able to stop the Allies right here at the West Wall. Speer ended his speech by asking for a few more minutes of their time. I have the honor, he announced, of introducing you to somebody very special. The door opened, and in walked Adolf Hitler. My heart pounded. Here was the only man still able to rally our people behind him. He looked old, frail, and quite pale. When he took a few steps toward the table, he seemed to limp. I guess it was an injury from the bomb explosion. As he lifted his right arm, we roared, Heil mein Führer!" And a smile flickered across his face. When he began to speak, his pale blue eyes seemed to bore directly into mine. He talked no more than five minutes, and what he said was meant for us, the Hitler Youth. We shall destroy the enemy at the very gates to the fatherland, he promised. This is where we are going to turn the tide and split the Allies once and for all. As we moved toward the door to leave, Hitler held out his arm and said a few special words to each of us. When I gripped his hand, it felt warm and sweaty, with little firmness. He glanced at the triangle on my upper left arm. You are from the muzzle then, my boy, he said. I know I can depend on you. Jawohl, mein Führer, I whispered. I wiped my eyes as I walked down the steps. I knew that nothing in the rest of my life would ever equal this day.